Looking to God for his help and his guidance, let's turn to Romans chapter 13 again and verse 12. Romans chapter 13 at verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Now the apostle draws our attention here to the importance of knowing the time. We all know the importance of that. We have watches for the time of day, calendars for the time of week and month, and so on. And he tells us in verse 11 that whatever we do in our Christian lives, we're to do it knowing the time. Knowing the time, he says in verse 11, that it is high time now to awaken out of sleep. And as he puts it in verse 12, the night is far spent. And the day is at hand. So it's important to know the time, or as the word really conveys, to know the season. To know the season. And by that, of course, he means the spiritual season. The spiritual time. The spiritual era. The spiritual temperature. Call it what you will. You'll remember, for example, that Christ rebuked the spiritual leaders in his own day because they didn't know the signs of the times. He said you can read the sky at night and in the morning and you can tell what kind of weather it is going to be. But he says you do not know the signs of the times. So you understand the natural climate but you don't understand the spiritual one. And I don't know if you're familiar with it but in the book of the Chronicles in the Old Testament the Bible commends the children of the tribe of Issachar because they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Now that's a marvelous description and it's one of those instances of a, a marvelous text coming in where you would least expect it. What you actually have is an enumeration of the tribes of Israel in the north and how they would naturally have moved or stayed with the house of Saul because they were vast in number and so on. But gradually they began to move to the house of David, even though there was nothing particularly promising about David at that particular time. You would have thought that the house of Saul would have still prevailed. But they moved and the people of Issachar are commanded or commended for that because they had understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. Now that's a great thing to have. It's a great thing to have yourself and to pray that others would have it. An understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. An understanding of the times to know what you should do. An understanding of the times to know what the church should do and society should do and so on. So the men of Issachar were to be commended for that. So we should know the time too. For example, in the New Testament, Paul tells Timothy, in the last days, perilous seasons shall come. Now we are living in the last days, according to the scripture. And in these last days, there will be perilous seasons. They will come and they will go. Now, it would be a strange man who would say that this is not a perilous season in the church and in the state. But I heard of such a strange man recently who is a minister of the gospel who said that there was no need to be mournful and sad, that the church overall was healthier than she had been for a long time in this country. Now, that is a man who does not know the times. That is a man who does not know the times. 
because there is no doubt, no doubt at all, that anyone who is taught and led by the Holy Spirit will understand that this is a day of small things. When there is a great need for repentance, renewal from God, a turning back to himself. So it's vital that we know the times. Well, what is the time then? I said a minute ago it's a perilous season, that's true. But even in a more general sense, what is the time? Well, Paul tells us here that it is nearly morning. He tells us in verse 12 that the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And which day is that? Well, he tells us in verse 11 that it's a day that brings salvation. In verse 11 he says, We know the time that it is high time to awaken because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So there is a day coming, a day is at hand, a day is imminent, imminent, just about to break, which brings salvation with it. Yes, but what day is that? Well, surely there's no doubt that what he's talking about here is the last day. Or the day of judgment. Or, as it's sometimes called in the scripture, the day of the Lord. Now, that day is surely coming. It was spoken of there in Thessalonians where the Lord returns with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet. And whether that's a day to await expectantly or a day to dread depends very simply on your spiritual condition. If you are in Christ, it's a day to welcome, to await, to anticipate. If you're not in Christ, it's a day to dread. And for some people, instead of being a day of brightness and of sunshine and glory, it is staggeringly a day that brings gloom and darkness. Now, these may be contrary figures to us. How can a day bring gloom and darkness? Well, that's what the Bible says happens. The minor prophets in the Old Testament speak about it quite often. Joel does, Amos does, Sephaniah does. They speak about the people who are waiting for the day of the Lord, waiting for his coming, waiting for the Lord's advent, because they expect the Lord to be on their side, you see. And they think the Lord will bring deliverance. He will bring help and gladness and blessing and wine and corn and who knows what. And the prophets have to warn them. Joel warns those who are awaiting the day of the Lord that for you, he says, it is a day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Amos, in chapter 5 and verse 18, says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Notice that. Woe to you who desire it, because it will be darkness to you. And Zephaniah, in chapter 1, says the same thing. Why? Well, because for them, it will be, as Revelation says, the great day of his wrath. And who will be able to stand? Revelation 6 and verse 17. So it's a solemn thought that some are awaiting this day, but actually it will be to them a day of wrath. For others, it's a day of brightness, a day of light, and a day of salvation. And we read about these things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says, we say this to you on the authority of God's word, that we who are still living when the Lord comes will have no precedent over those who have died. Because when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, it is the dead in Christ who will rise. And we who are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But concerning the times and the seasons, he says, you don't need me to write to you. 
You yourselves know that this day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people are saying peace and safety, then he says sudden destruction comes upon them, just like labor pains on a pregnant woman. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should come like a thief on you. You are a watchful people. You are the children of the light and you are the sons of the day, not of night and not of darkness. Therefore, he says, let's not sleep, but let us watch and be sober. Sleepers sleep in the night. Drunkards get drunk at night. But we who belong to the day, let us be sober, waiting for the day. Yes, we live in a night, in a dark world, but we are children of the day and we are sons of the day. So putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation, let us wait for the advent of the day of the Lord. So what that goes to show is that for some people, there's reason to anticipate it. And for others, there's a reason to dread it. And it's impossible to say that without stopping and asking yourself, do you anticipate the day or do you dread it? The thought that the Lord is coming, that he's returning as the judge of the earth, does it make you tremble? Does it make you excited? Does it make you glad, fearful? It's an awesome event in itself from whichever perspective you view it. But does it make you tremble in fear? Or does it make you reach out towards it in glad anticipation? Paul was like that. He reached out towards it. Now then, in what sense is this day at hand? In verse 11, we know the time. In verse 12, the night, that's this world's night, is far spent and the day is at hand. To put that into context, this is written 2,000 years ago. In what sense is the coming of the Lord at hand? Well, I think he says it is at hand in three ways. They're all true. First, it's at hand in the light of eternity. How imminent it is in the light of the aeons of eternity that are to come. Yet a little while and history will come to its close. Suppose, for the sake of argument, it is another 10,000 years. What is that? In the light of the thousands and the millions and the millions of years that are yet to be. Nothing in comparison with that ocean of vastness and eternity. This day of the Lord is a historical event which is coming in time. Yes, to wind up history as we know it, but it belongs to this world. It belongs to the story of this world. It is its climax and its consummation. So just in that sense, it is imminent and it is close. Any event in time, it is close in comparison with eternity. So in the light of eternity, it is at hand. It's also at hand in the light of your death. How? Well, because it is death that links you to this day. However far away it is as an event, you are joined to it by the moment of your death. It is death that bridges the gap. Suppose again, for the sake of argument, that this coming of the Lord is another 10,000 years away. Still, your death ushers you into it. In the sense that as you die now, that day shall find you then. There is nothing in you that can change between the moment of your death and the advent of that day. As the tree falls, so it shall lie. You die filthy, you shall be filthy still. You die unjust, and you shall be unjust still. And in that sense, the sense in which your destiny is sealed, 
and closed and finished at the day of your death is the very sense in which judgment comes close to you. The day of the Lord comes close to you. It finds you as you die, so death ushers you into it. And what in a sense is death but the day of the Lord reaching forward a little bit and plucking you into it? Is that not really what it is? So in the light of both these things, it is at hand. God's judgment is at hand in the light of eternity. And God's judgment is at hand in the light of my death. And who knows how soon that may be. We're dying, friends. We're all dying. And we walk about in our bustle and in our, in our hustle and in our business as though we were going to live forever. As though we're big and important in the world. And it doesn't take much to snuff us out. Just a little while and you're gone. Like your relatives have gone and your parents have gone and your neighbors have gone. You're going too. And so the day of the Lord shall find you reaching forward to bring you into it. Third, this day of the Lord is at hand in the light of faith. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that faith closes the distance. When faith looks at anything God does, it seems near. It doesn't matter how far away it actually is. Perhaps the best way to think about that is to leave aside the second coming for a minute and go back to the first coming. When was that? 2,000 years ago. Yes, and it felt all of 2,000 years ago too. When you heard it being preached about and you read about it in the Bible, the customs, the modes, the methods of torture, the crucifixion, the Roman soldiers, it's old, it's dusty, it's historical, it's in the past. But when the Holy Spirit started to grapple with you, how different that appeared. The whole thing was just brought right into the present. It was as though Christ was being placarded in front of you. It is as though the crucifixion was taking place somewhere near you. The cross of Christ was that close. The cross was near and Christ was present because faith made it like that. Faith brought it graphically into the present and into the here and now. You didn't have to do any more with a Christ who had lived 2,000 years ago, but a Christ who was dying as it were now. You had to do with the cross, a real event, in real time, in real space, and how close to you in space and time. Faith bridged 2,000 years and made it nothing. No. You understand that because you felt it and experienced it. Now, instead of going back 2,000, move forward, let's say, another 2,000. Let's move forward another 10. And the Lord is coming. And to some people, oh yes, when? Peter tells us that people will scoff and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers were here, all things remain unchanged. Far distant future, never at all. The further back you put it, the more likely it is that no such event will ever come. But for you as a Christian, faith shrinks the gap. Faith makes the second coming of the Lord as powerful, as proximate, as near as the first coming of the Lord. Oh, the power and the presence of the crucified Christ. Oh, the power and the presence of a descending Christ, a blowing trumpet and the voice of an archangel. The power and the presence of a Christ who has his rewards with him in his right hand and in his left. The power and the presence of a Christ who is imminently opening the door into heaven and opening the door into hell because he has the gates, the, uh, the keys of death and of Hades on his shoulder. It's no longer a future event, but to faith it is a present reality. Man, he's here, he's coming. The judge is at the door and it is imminent. So the scoffer may say, where is the promise of his coming? But if you're alive and well spiritually, you'll say, he's here. I feel him. He's near me and he's calling me. And the more spiritual you are, 
the more real the coming of Christ is, the more imminent it is, the more at hand it is. So, if we know the time, that the day of his coming is at hand, what should our response be? Well, it's very simple. Wake up, he says. Wake up. Do this, verse 11, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep completely. If there's anything belonging to sleep at all still clinging to you, get out of it. You know what it was like sometimes, perhaps when you started, it may not just be when you started, but very often it happened when you started work for the first time and you were conscious that you'd slept through an alarm before the habits of doing that kind of thing were more fully set and you suddenly looked at the time and realized that there was just about no time left. And you got up and you put off your night clothes and you put on your day clothes and you went out to do whatever had to be done. It was that sense of shock that the time was just on you, you see. And the urgency with which you had to get ready and to do what you had to do. That's the image he's got here. Put off, he says, the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light because it is high time to awaken out of sleep because the day of the Lord is at hand. So waken up. Who? Well, you get the feeling here that he's almost primarily talking to Christian people. He says at the end of verse 11, it's high time to awaken for now our salvation is nearer than when he first believed. What we first believed. So he's talking to himself. He's talking to all Christian people. They've got to awaken out of sleep. But there's no doubt that this is true in a very general sense. The sense in which everybody is asleep and needs to wake up. Now I suppose you can think of the unbeliever sleeping and the Christian sleeping in slightly different ways. Of course you can. But there are similarities. Let's take yourself as an unbeliever. You are sleeping. It's the sleep of death, it's called elsewhere. Maybe you're unconcerned and you're unalarmed. You're just sleeping on, you know, and the world does that to you. There's something about its grind, something about its routine. Well, yes, routine is comforting. It's also an anesthetic. It also num numbs you to the realities of this world and to the realities of eternity. It just goes on and on. As the scoffer said in Peter, the world continues as it was, and so do you. You get up, you go to work, you come home, and you have your tea. And later on at night, you go to bed. And so it goes on and on and on. And you just don't feel the time ticking and the clock moving and the judgment of God at hand and the coming of Christ resistibly drawing closer. You feel none of it. Sometimes you get a shock looking in the mirror. Sometimes you realize that there's a line or two extra. Sometimes you see the color of your hair change. Sometimes you're conscious that your body is not as strong as it was, but by and large you still breathe on. And you're still oblivious to the reality of what's actually happening. And that is that you are about to meet your God. That is that you're about to stand before your maker, who will search you inside out and either consign you to heaven or to hell. Asleep? Are you fast asleep? You can sit and listen to sermons. You can sit and listen to this. Not from me, but from anybody else. And it just washes over you. And you'll go home. And you'll have your supper. And you'll go to bed. And you'll do the same the next Sunday. And the next. And the next. Because you're fast asleep. No change. Christian, you too can be asleep. Like the church in the Song of Solomon, I sleep, but my heart wakeneth. It is the voice of my beloved. That was a good experience in the history of the church there. It wasn't so good that she was asleep, but what was good was that her heart was awakening. And what was making the heart awaken? It was the voice of her beloved. 
Praise God for the voice of the beloved. If that didn't come, you would stay and sleep, and you would perish asleep. But the voice of my beloved, that woke her up. Many a time as a Christian, you've become conscious, thanks to God, that you've been asleep. And what's made you conscious of it is the voice that woke you up. The voice of Christ saying, what are you doing? The voice of the Christ in the garden of Gethsemane, you say, are you asleep? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Because yes, the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane are a case in point, a sleepy church. It may be the case that the five wise virgins were a case in point too, fast asleep when the Lord suddenly came. So maybe God's call to you too as a Christian tonight is to wake up properly, properly. Shrug off the vestiges of sleep and start to live as a people who belong to the day. Well, what do you do when you get up? Well, Paul says here that you put off your night clothes, put on your day clothes. Verse 12, midway through the verse, Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. Now the language used in the Greek is just putting off your clothes. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So this is a call to everybody to put off the works of darkness. What are they? Well, that's just the lifestyle of sleepy people. What's it like? Verse 13. Let us walk properly, soberly, sensibly, as in the daytime, he says. Uh, you'll notice what he's saying all the time. The day is not here yet. The day is coming. The day that brings heaven in. The day that brings righteousness in. Let's walk as though it was here, he says. Let's walk on earth as though you were in heaven. So let's walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife. And envy. These are the works of darkness that you've got to put off. Now, that doesn't cover everything. He's just giving examples here of what works of darkness actually are. There's many more things he could add, and he does add them, for example, in Galatians chapter 5, where he talks about the works of the flesh. He mentions this is Galatians 5.19. He mentions adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. These are all sexual sins. He mentions idolatry, sorcery. These are to do with overt uh, witchcraft and so on. Hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, he says. In other words, I'm not even finished there, he says. There's more. Of which I tell you, as I told you before, that those who practice such things, he says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now here it's a shorter list in verse 13. Revelry, drunkenness, lewdness, lust, strife, envy. Sometimes we need to stop and think what these things are. What is revelry? This word used to be a little lost on us because it was translated in the King James as rioting. Now that was fine in the 17th century, but to us rioting conveys images of people going around London and looting and things like that. Whereas actually this word revelry now catches what it is. It is essentially really a party. That's what it is. It is a party at which drink flows freely, which lo loosens the tongue, moves to drunkenness, to dancing, and usually to sexual immorality. They were well known in Greek society, from the upper to the more lower classes. They were late parties, sometime well after dinner, it would be a party which was characterized by loose talk brought around usually by drink, 
followed later by dancing, usually by sexual immorality. One thing sliding quite easily into the other. So it's interesting that revelry is followed immediately by drunkenness. This is just put together. The revelry and drunkenness go together. So these were well-known things which Christians abstained from. I'll come to that in a second. Then again, unsurprisingly, he moves to sexual sin again, lewdness and lust. Lewdness is a kind of catch-all Greek term for sexual misbehavior generally. Lust is just what we think of it. Then he moves to sins of the passion, of the mind, of the heart, strife and envy. These things too are bad. We could categorize the former things and say, well, some of them are worse, but he wants us to be very careful about that. You may be sexually pure and you may be the source of constant strife or you may be bursting full of envy or jealousy. In any case, Paul says, cast that off you, he says. Put it off like clothing that you just don't want to wear anymore. Uh, sometimes it can happen to you when you become a Christian that you physically have garments that you don't want to wear anymore because they're just not appropriate, not right anymore. That can be the case. But what he's saying is that morally you have clothing which you put off because they are not fitting anymore. And he tells the Ephesians, you know, to step up this kind of thing more and more all the time. He says, um, he says that they've put aside some things, and then he says, make sure that you put aside other things. Bitterness, wrath, anger, evil speaking, malice, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not be named among you, not filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, crude jesting, sexual innuendo, things which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So then, we're to constantly be putting these things away. And I want you to notice here too that when he says that we're to cast off these works of darkness, he goes a little further in verse 14. He tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll come to that in a second, but make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. In other words, don't plan for opportunities to fulfill these lusts. Don't give them an opportunity. In other words, guard your life so that you don't make provision for the flesh. I read an interesting quote a few years ago, it always stuck with me, which said this, many Christians flee temptation, but they leave a forwarding address. You know what a forwarding address is. You've moved, but you tell people, well, here I am and here's where you'll find me. See, that some people flee temptation like that. They leave a forwarding address. In other words, you make it easy for the devil to find you again. Very, very easy. There are situations and circumstances in which you can be guaranteed that he's going to find you. I think I... I hinted at this just the other week, really, when I was speaking about Dinah, Jacob's daughter, who went out to mix with the Canaanite girls and found herself way, way out of her depth. And the danger of Christian people doing that. In other words, if you're trying to flee sexual immorality and drunkenness, it's not smart to go to a nightclub, is it? No, not at all and so on. There will be times and places where you stand on Satan's ground where he says, oh, you're coming right onto my patch. I'll take the opportunity. Thank you very much. And there's a kind of strange naivety abroad today that thinks that we have some kind of force field and protective shield around us, which means that we can say anything, go anywhere, 
attend any film in the cinema, it doesn't matter what the rating is, and that you can go to any club. Do you really? Do you really think you can? Honestly, are you that ignorant of yourself? Are you that ignorant of your own heart? Are you that ignorant of your own corruption? Are you that ignorant of the devil's power? Are you? Are you that spiritually naive as to think you can just do all that? That is a sign of gross spiritual immaturity. And the strange thing is that it's passed off as maturity. Oh, I can handle that. Oh, I can go to the nightclub. Oh, no, you cannot. I assure you, it is dragging you down. I can assure you that the force at work in that place will drag you to the lowest compartment of hell if it can possibly do so. So you don't just cast off the revelry and the drunkenness and the sexual immorality. You make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Leave no forwarding addresses and don't make the devil's job easy for him. Very simple, very straightforward. Now then, you'll notice that it's not just a negative here, there's a positive. In verse 12, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Put on your day clothes. That's the day clothes is just the lifestyle of people who are awake. It's the lifestyle of people who are looking forward to the day of the Lord, the lifestyle of people who expect to be on the Lord's side when he comes. You'll recognize them because they're already wearing the clothes. You see, they're going to the wedding banquet and they have the wedding garment on, the real thing. They belong there. Of course, you'll find in the parable, is it Matthew 22? You'll find in the parable of the wedding garment that there's a man who goes in and he doesn't have the right garment on. And the king says, what are you doing here? Bind him hand and, hand and foot and put him out. And we're told that he was put out into the outer darkness. He didn't have the right clothing on. But you recognize the Christians because they have the daytime clothing on even in the nighttime of this world's existence. Now, you say, well, he doesn't tell us what the daytime clothes are. Well, actually he does, not in verses 12 and 13 and 14, but you have to go just a little bit further back. In chapter 12, he starts telling us what holiness of life is. For example, verse 9, let your love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate to each other with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in your spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, being patient in your trials, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Notice the practicality of verse 13. You're distributing to the needs of the saints. You're given to hospitality. You're blessing those who persecute you, and you are not cursing and so on. Move into chapter 13 itself. Verse 1, you're to be subject to the governing authorities which are from God. Verse uh, 6, you pay taxes to them because they are God's ministers looking after that. Verse 7, you render to all their due. Again, he talks of taxes and customs. Interesting how often he talks about that. You would relegate it to the utterly trivial, but he mentions it very often. You fear those who should and you honor those who should. You take care in verse 8 to owe nobody anything except simply to love them. You take care in verse 9 not to commit adultery, to commit murder, or to bear false witness against your brother, or to covet. Or, he says, verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor, and so on. Verse 11, and do this knowing the time. Now immediately do you see what this is. This is the life of holiness. Put it on. Itemized garment after itemized garment. You can't put on all your clothes in a one hour. 
You may try and do it if you're in a rush, but you take garment by garment and you put it on properly. Each thread in the garment of holiness is to be woven. Each item in the armor, wear it. By the way, you'll notice that the clothing here is referred to as an armor. You wondered why that is. It's because when you put on these things, you're going to find yourself fighting. You're going to find yourself in a world that doesn't work like that. A world that doesn't think like that. And so you're going to find that, that the Christian clothing you put on is immediately attracting hostility. But by putting it on, you are fighting the Lord's battle. You are making a positive witness. By living like this, you are fighting on the Lord's side. You are being the Lord's soldier. Yes, you'll get hostility, but you are fighting simply by living like that. It is an armor. A life of holiness is itself an armor that is fighting the Lord's battle. But what I want you to notice is, as well as all that, that when he comes to telling us specifically here in verse 12 to put on the armor of light, instead of itemizing it, he puts it another way in verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why does he put it like that? Well, a few reasons. First of all, because he provides the clothing. It's impossible for you to love without Christ enabling you to love. It's impossible for you not to commit adultery or murder or lie or covet unless Christ enables you to do that. In other words, he's not telling you to take up a different morality. He's telling you to receive a spirituality from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is the giver of these things. Only he can give that virtue and only he can put it into you by his Holy Spirit. It's his garment. It is his clothing. Oh, friend, it is he who wears it best. It is he who wears it most beautifully. He wears it perfectly in heaven as the man Christ Jesus and he wore it perfectly on the earth. And you know, I sometimes wonder if that's a reason why he puts it like this too. Because he says, when I want you to see the clothing that you wear, he says, I want you to see it on a person. Uh, when a shop wants you to buy clothes, it doesn't just stack them on a shelf. It sticks them on a model. And you're invariably drawn to what's on the model, are you not? Just because there's something about it that makes it look more accessible. It looks more impressive, usually, than when you put it on yourself. But, of course, what happens here, you see, is that you look at it in a model, too. And who is the model? Who's the best model? Well, yes, some people may model it better than others. Be imitators of me, Paul said. <laughs> what a staggering thing to say. Even as I imitate God. But the greatest model is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's why there is no substitute for reading the Gospels and reading them often. Read the Gospels and read them often. Yes, the epistles are important, wonderful, instructive. But there's something about the Gospels. What is that something? Well, it's the embodiment of virtue. It's the way in which it's really wrapped together in a person. It's listening to Christ speak. It's watching Christ behave. It's watching him move. It's seeing him act. It's watching the pity, the compassion, watching the justice, watching the tender-heartedness, the kindness, watching the long-suffering, the ability to bear, the ability to comfort, everything. It's all mingled together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. And you put him on by reading him. You put him on by praying to him. 
You put him on by so coming into contact with him in the pages of scripture that you are transformed into that image from glory to glory. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well then, the little children, it is the last hour, John says. These are the last days. The day is at hand. Wake up and get up. Put on the clothes that are appropriate for those who are going to meet the Lord and share eternity with him. And be ready to meet him so that when he comes, you may meet him without shame. Do it. Do it quickly. The day is at hand. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, truly, this day is at hand. How close it is. And sometimes we can all feel it. And we pray to be so conscious of it that we would ready ourselves for it just now. For we have no time to waste. There is so little time in which to do good. Life that seemed so long when we were young, that seemed to stretch out in endless days, months and years when we were children, is suddenly looking so short. How little time we have to do good. Give us grace, O Lord, to do good in it. In Christ's precious name, amen. Our closing psalm is the 16th psalm on page 17. Psalm 16, page 17. At verse 5, the tune is Golden Hill. We'll sing down to verse 8, four stanzas. O Lord, you are to me my cup and portion sure. The share that is assigned to me you guard and keep secure. The land allotted me, and this is the heavenly land that it's really pointing towards, is in a pleasant sight. And surely my inheritance to me is a delight. I'll praise the Lord my God whose counsel guides my choice. And even in the night, my heart recalls instruction's voice. Before me constantly, I set the Lord alone. Because he is at my right hand, I'll not be overthrown. 